Good evening. I'm Rob Davis. I'm the assistant director of the BSN program. I know a few of you out there. Uh, welcome to the 2007 Rosella Schlotfeld Lecture Series. It's our privilege to have Dr. Mona Counts with us this evening as our guest speaker. Dr. Counts will be formally introduced in just a few minutes, but I'd like to give you a brief background of the Rosella Schlotfeld Lecture Series. Uh, the series seeks to raise awareness of the importance of nursing care in the community, both locally, nationally, and globally. Last year, our public lecture highlighted the global aspect of public health, and we learned about health care in China. This year, we'll learn more about some innovative and exciting things being done by nurses in rural populations right here in the U.S. Rosella Schlotfeld was the former dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing from 1960 to 1972. She was known for her innovative thinking, prolific writing, her commitment to nursing theory, and her intense belief in the difference that nursing and nurses can make a difference in this world. Tonight you'll hear about just that, nurses making a profound difference in the lives of people. Dean May Weichel had hoped to be here to welcome you to the lecture but was unable to make it. She sent a greeting that I'll read to you. She said, on behalf of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mona Counts to our school as the 2007 Rosella Schlotfeld Lecturer. Dr. Counts has long been a leader and role model in the development of the nurse practitioner role and champion of the healthcare, of healthcare for the poor and underserved. We're grateful for the opportunity to have her with us. I also want to welcome all of you to this evening's lecture. This is an occasion when we come together as a community to celebrate our nursing heritage, to grapple with our current challenges in healthcare, and to renew our commitment to meet those challenges. Thank you for coming to share this time with us. There's a message from Dr. Weichel. Dr. Lynn Lotus, the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs and the BSN Program Director at the School of Nursing, uh, became unfortunately ill this morning, poor thing, and uh, is also unable to be here this evening. Uh, we wish her well tonight. Uh, she asked me to pass on this greeting to all of you. Dr. Lotus said, on behalf of the BSN program and the Rosella Schlotfeld Lecture Planning Committee, I also want to welcome all of you to this evening's lecture. I'm particularly excited about this year's lecturer, Dr. Mona Counts. A person who has worked closely with Dr. Counts commented that, quote, Mona Counts is one of the reasons people in this country believe in nurses and nursing, unquote. Certainly, she reminds me of why I believe in nurses and nursing. Again, welcome to the 2007 Rosella Schlotfeld Lecture, and thank you all for coming. Yay. I'll now turn the podium over to Kathleen Montgomery, who will introduce our speaker. You'll be glad to hear that I'm not going to repeat anything that's in your program about our speaker. You have a couple of pages on the inside describing her many talents and her many awards that she's won. She did tell us at dinner that this has been in her hometown newspaper and she's heard from a lot of our alumni from all over uh, asking her about her presentation tonight. So she was actually a little bit stunned about our alumni and how many there were all over uh, asking about her presentation. We are very honored to have Mona here and we're very honored to have her host some of our students for some of their practicums. It is a, a very um, great site to think about going. She started off in nursing getting a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Florida in 19... And she went on to get credentials <laughs> in guidance and counseling and family therapy, and then on to get a degree, her master's degree from Emory University and her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. I might say that over that 12-year span, she really exemplifies someone who just kept on going she didn't stop and take a break to practice for five years and then go back for the next degree. She continued on with her education at the same time that she continued on uh, moving her practice forward. She shared some stories about her first job, 
uh, the mystery meat meals on night shift where everything was in one pot and you weren't quite sure what they were feeding you. Uh, she shared that she actually had started out as a major in chemistry and was admitted to med school, went to med school for a semester, and they kept addressing the class gentlemen, even after they were cor corrected that there were two women in the uh, class, they continued on addressing the class as gentlemen. And so she decided she had enough of medicine and switched to nursing. Nursing had a different focus. She discovered that early on. Some describe her as a pistol. And I think that that would, uh, from our conversations at dinner, fit. And it would certainly fit being a Rosella Schlotfeld lecturer because Rosella was a pistol. So uh, Mona really exemplifies a career that combines education, research, and practice. She has never ventured far from practice, has worked in a variety of settings, and really now it has the job that every nurse practitioner aspires to have, be your own boss, have your independent practice. Mona, we're very happy to have you here. Good. I am a pistol, I guess. Actually, I am in practice. You don't have a job when you really, truly take a practice. You have a calling, you have a vocation, you have an avocation. And so I'm living kind of my dream. And the fact that we actually are practicing and showing outcomes is just really cool. So I'd like to share how we got to where we are and what we're doing with it. Um, she was going to tell some of the nasty stories about when I was first a nurse. My first job, I got fired five times, guys. <laughs> Wasn't nice. I didn't understand some of the background cultural things that were inherent in some of the practices. And so when some man came in and said, I need to make rounds, and I said, fine, who are you? and he identified as Dr. So-and-so, and I said, go ahead and make rounds. And he says, no, you're supposed to carry the charts. I said, why, you have a broken arm? I got fired then. So I didn't understand it, but what I did do is I kept, finally started checking my watch to see how long it took him to hire me back. And so it got down to about 15 minutes after I was fired, and each time they'd hire me back, I went for a higher salary. So I, started going to graduate school, but I still worked all the time because my one thing that I always, do you all remember the fundamentals teacher you guys had? Did you often wonder if they knew how to make a bed? You guys aren't even laughing. How many of you are students? All right. We used to always joke that some of the faculty that we had couldn't do what they tried to make us do. And so my contention was that I should never teach anything that I couldn't do myself. And so that has been my mantra all the way through. So anything that I have taught, I've also been doing myself. Well, one of the things that happened is I had been living in Europe and it was a wonderful place to live. And I was working with World Health Organization and we were doing, setting up um, practices so that people out in rural areas or backwoods areas that would be transported in, we would do train the trainer kinds of things where we were helping people learn how to take care of folks, say in Africa, so that by the time they got to a tertiary care setting, they still had something to work with. Is that me? Uh, okay, just loud beeps. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I had been doing that, and when I came back to the States, I wanted my daughter to be, learn what it was like to be an American. So we had been living in Europe for five years. So I brought her back to the States, and I went to the D.C. area, couldn't stand the lifestyle, moved to originally West Virginia, and set up their NP program, which is what I had done all over the country, is started NP programs. So I figured, well, I'll get my daughter through high school and then I'm out of here, I'm back on the road, I'm gonna go back to Europe, I'm traveling all over. 
did some guy's physical, invited him to dinner. I wound up with a farm and more kids, and that's how I got in Appalachia. So when we moved to the farm, what happened was I'd go to get my newspaper. And they'd be all lined up in my driveway saying, can you check Johnny's ears? Should I send Sarah to school today? Can you stop by and see Grandma on the way? This all led to all kinds of things, and I thought, you know, if all these people are lined up in my driveway, then there must be some kind of need, but you can't just go from the cardiac method of evaluation. Do you know how y'all do that? Have you studied the cardiac method of evaluation? It's I feel it in my heart, therefore it is. Um, that's not really good solid data. So what we did was an ethnographic study of the area, and that was the basis on which we started the practice. I had studied Appalachians using ethnography for the last 12 years. And in the meantime, one of your visiting faculty here came and recruited me to Penn State. <laughs> Said, what would it take to get you to move? Because I was living in Pennsylvania, the practice was in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania really did reach out. And so that's why I am now with Penn State and that's Sarah Gilner. So you guys can, if you haven't met her, do, because she's got some wonderful ideas. Anyway, so we started off doing the ethnographic survey and that's what I'm gonna share with you to start with. And you notice I have healthcare system in quotes because it's an illness care system. It is not healthcare. We are like the little Holland guys sticking our finger in the dike, just waiting for it to break instead of going after making people healthy or helping them become healthy. One of the things we found when we did the ethnography is you have to do culturally competent care. And that means you have to understand the person's culture. And in order to address any of their needs, you have to go after their culture. You have to empower the community. You develop partners and coalitions, and I apologize, I wish I was magic, it could change the temperature in here, so we could bring in ice things or something for you, because it is very warm. It's cooler down here, but this is like church, you all wanna sit in the back. <clears throat> Technology is something that you need to have and you need to incorporate in your practices. And sometimes you can even demonstrate the future for the best practices. One of the things I was looking at is Appalachian patterns, and I want to explain what that is. This is general ethnographic nursing evaluation studies in the state. And what we did is we went out and we would take a whole group of graduate students and do it in a three-day time period and interview one of the gra former graduate students is your faculty, by the way. Um, we'd interview all these folks within a one-day time period. And Every community we went into in Appalachia would be split by somehow or another. Can you all think about where you grew up? I want all of you to think about it. Go back to where you grew up. How was the community divided? How about you, back here, with the green shirt and red hair? Um, if you had to think about your community, there were different groups of people. How were they divided? Okay, in your community, it was young and the old. How about somebody over here? The gentleman sitting up there with the white shirt. Yes? School By school districts. Where'd you grow up? Is, that's in this area? Okay. How about over here? Yes, ma'am? Uh, there were two high schools in my town. So by high schools. High school, that other high school. Okay, if you all think about it, every community is divided in some manner, shape, or form. Some communities, it's that side of the tracks versus that side of the tracks. Some communities, it's this side of the mountain versus that side of the mountain. Uh, some communities, it's the rich guys versus the ones that don't have. Some communities, it could be by ethnic background. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things, but every community you ever find will be divided in some manner, shape, or form. What would be really interesting is when we would go do these research projects in a defined community, my graduate students would divide within the first day. 
they would side with one side of the community or the other, no matter how that community was divided. And so we would play referees when we try to debrief and get all the data and the information and do the transcriptions and find the problems. It was a fascinating exercise, but then what it allowed us to do is to go back and give the right kind of information to that community so that they could solve their own problems. Okay? And I just laughed because we'd actually have some really knock down drag outs. The findings that we came out from doing, we've got 15,000 Appalachian interviews. So what we did was abstract all these findings. And what you really, we found is you had to go after what people perceived their need to be. And that is much different than what epidemiology says. If you go into an environment, like we went into one county and they had just gotten a new cardiac surgeon. So guess what everybody in that county thought their problem was? Oh, I want to see the new cardiac surgeon. I've got heart disease. That's our number one problem is heart disease. In reality, their number one problem was they didn't even have a safe water supply. But if you want to address what people want, you have to go what they perceive they need. And then you can deal with the water. You gotta find out who the power is. Who's the most powerful person in your school? Is it the dean? When I ask that question at Penn State, it depends if it's football season or basketball season. Because when you say that during football season, Papa Joe is the most powerful person at Penn State. Now, if you ask Papa Joe, he says no, which is a real interesting kind of thing. People perceive people to have power so that they give that power to them, but they, that person doesn't necessarily know that they're powerful. I mean, they know they can change things, but they don't know it. And one of the things we found is in order to do this kind of research, you have to get the power behind you. And so we would get the power person. And how we'd find them is you stop at the gas station, you go to the school, you go to the grocery store. And now remember, this is all rural Appalachia, so it's not like big city stuff. And so we'd ask, who's the three most powerful people in this county, town, whatever the area was? And we would keep coming up with the same names. And that's who we started with. And then we'd do nominative sampling and go all through and keep going till we had 1% of the population, but we started with the power first. You also need to look at the resources. What is available? What community organizations are already there? What can you capitalize on? And what are the barriers? And sometimes the barriers take forefront when they shouldn't. When I was working on presenting this, and I'd like to just share this with you, and I'll let Rob have a copy of it, but this came off of Wikipedia, which I didn't have or wasn't available when we first started, but if you really look at the culture you're talking about, you're talking about the folk culture. And it refers to the localized lifestyle of a subsistence or otherwise inward looking culture, and that describes Appalachia. It is usually handed down through oral tradition, has a strong sense of community, and values the old ways over novelty. Finally, folk culture is often imbued with a sense of place. If its elements are copied by or removed to a foreign locale, they'll stay strong and connotation of their original place of creation. And when I moved to Appalachia, I really, my family of origin is originally from Greenbrier County, West Virginia, although I never grew up there. I grew up in Southern Florida. I transferred all over the world. I made 19 moves in 15 years. So I got to see all kinds of things. But when I got back to Appalachia, I couldn't understand why I was so comfortable. I mean, I like to clan, I like to grow things, and I just really clicked. And that kind of describes it, because the oral history actually gives you the folk culture. Now, you guys all have your own from your own families of origin. Well, the Appalachian characteristics that are so cool, hardiness. If folks make it past what I call the trauma years, you know what the trauma years are? 
that usually you, you get past the trauma years at about age 40. That's when you realize it's not really cool to stay up all night, do drugs, and drink. And it's not really fun to drink and drive because that's not a real wise move. So it's when people really start settling down. And if Appalachians live past the trauma years, then they can live to be very old. And one of the things I share is, I, my oldest patient's 103. She lives by herself. She grows her garden, she still does her caning. And she gives me heck because I don't do my beans right. The other thing is a sense of family, but it's not family as you perceive it. It's not just the nuclear family. Family is the in-laws, the outlaws, everybody else's laws. And if you're related in any manner, shape, or form, then you're part of the family. Actually, somebody won a bet one time saying that they could stop at any house and they would find that they were related. They were like fifth cousins, so they won the bet. The other thing real important in Appalachia is continuity. And the continuity of care becomes very important. One of the things we found is people did not want to have the Public Health Service Corps folks come in and leave after two years. They wanted somebody that was gonna stay, that would work with them, that wasn't gonna leave them, and that would follow through. So that became most important. Acceptance. Appalachians tolerate an awful lot of diversity. You'll find a shack right next to a McMansion, and you'll see it all over Appalachia. You'll see trailers next to big houses. And the gentleman that was nude in the middle of the road with a shotgun saying, no, he wouldn't go to the hospital until one of us came to pick him up and take him, was also tolerated. So you see a lot of diversity tolerated. Appalachians are very spiritual, not necessarily in the way that you think of an organized church or religion, but they are extremely ethereal. They really are tied to the mountains, and it's almost like a Zen kind of concept. And age, what's age? The gentleman back there with the, no, the lady with the, maroon shirt on and your hair is up. What's age? Okay, how old you are? What's aging? Anybody else? What's old? What's old? How about you? Mm-hmm. 20... <laughs> Excuse me, I've got to get a wheelchair and I understand her. <laughs> Interesting, if you ask that term in Appalachia, if you ask what is old, old is a state of mind. Old, can, you can find somebody that's 20 years old that's old, or you can find somebody that's 80 years old that's young. And it's a state of mind and function. And it has to be function in all three areas. It has to be function physical, mental, and spiritual. And if you are functioning, you're not old. And it doesn't matter what your chronological age is. That is also true for their definition of health. That if they are functional, they're healthy. I don't care if their hemoglobin A1C is 15. If they're still functional, they're healthy. So that when you're talking about tailoring care, it has got to be culturally specific. We did the same project in DC, by the way and I'll share with what patterns they changed in a little bit. That's down from our house, and it's uh, one of the rivers that run through, and you can whitewater raft if y'all wanna come visit. Some of the other characteristics, you don't produce a lot of yuppies in Appalachia, because the whole concept of self is we, and if you listen to their languaging, it's always we can do this, we will, we can, and you don't hear I very much at all. The whole concept of time is, it's always here. It's here now, it's always, they're very present oriented, but it'll go on forever. One of the people said, but there's no jobs here. Well, that's all right, my family's here. You know, the mountains are here, they're gonna be here, they'll be here forever, we're gonna be here. Commitment, once they make a commitment, they're gonna stick to it, so you won't have any difficulty at all knowing that. And the view of health is just like the view of aging. If you can function, you're healthy. Now you may have high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, 
peripheral vascular disease, but you're still working the farm and you're playing with your grandkids and you can go to church, so therefore you're healthy. Some of the barriers in Appalachia, one of the biggest ones is the economics. Appalachia has been um, land that you've had extractive industries forever. That means all of the coal mines, the oil and gas, the lumber, all of the natural resources in the area have been taken out. That is a coal mine. Have you guys ever seen one? We just had one go under our house, so it's been very interesting. Um, but that's a tipple on the outside. So coal is an extractive industry. One of the problems with extractive industries is none of the folks that own that live in the area. So all the money goes out of the area. So you don't get the industry bringing money back in. So economically, they're very depressed. Employment is really a hassle. Most of the young folks travel to either the DC area or large metropolitan areas to do things like construction or any other kinds of jobs because there are not a lot of jobs. If you're not in the service industry or if you're not part of the coal mining industry, there's not a lot of opportunities. In the service industry, you all know, are healthcare and education and those kinds of things. So employment is a problem. The other thing that happens is, I always put a Taco Bell or a McDonald's or whatever have you. One, that we do have them, and two, I want to tell you, I am wearing shoes. Um, because you're from Appalachia, they say you don't wear shoes. But One of the things with all the fast food places and the chains is that what do they hire folks at? Minimum wage, 39 and a half hours a week, so you don't have to have health care benefits. And so you have a lot of working poor without any coverage. The industries we talked about, these two old guys, by the way, are 89, and I'm sorry the picture's not better. Those are two mules, and they actually don't, they refuse to do clear cutting. They have some property. They cut mature trees and they bring them down because they've got walnut and really high class wood trees. And these two old guys, they're brothers, 88 and 89, I think, and they're two mules. And they cut one tree at a time and drag it out of the woods. And three trees, that's what they live on for the year. And now we're getting a resurgence because the gas prices are so high of oil and gas exploration. And so the Appalachian terrain's getting hit on again because it's a lot of gas reserves. The strengths, barriers, and needs that we found, they needed, as I referred to earlier, the continuity. This is what you look at when you're coming down from where this practice is. And it looks like there's nobody living out there, except we have 6,000 patients that we serve. But getting over that far side of the mountain, it puts you on the continental divide, the eastern continental divide. So it becomes very difficult. Now this is one of the things, one of the coal companies decided to give something back to the region because they take all the money out of there. So they developed this lake. And it was from where they had done some dredging and all this kind of stuff and they make this beautiful lake. Now in order for somebody to go fishing on this lake or to utilize this lake, they have to make an 85 mile trip one way to get a permit to do that. So as you can see, there's not a lot of folks on the lake. This is another thing in Appalachia. I don't know if any of you have all seen it. This is the highest bridge covering a gorge. That's the New River Gorge Bridge. Have you ever heard of it? And that's bridge day is when they do bungee jumping off of it. Now, my daughters were really creative when they were doing bungee jumping. They get down to the bottom of the bridge and drive the guys back up so they get to meet them. But, you know, that's. But I, I did not bungee jump, I will have to say. I do ride the river. There's some great rapids down there if you all ever get down there. It's the New River. And that's going down the New River Gorge. One of the things about Appalachia, it's got beautiful recreational spots, it's absolutely gorgeous country. Um, and you don't see the local residents taking advantage of it. They're usually outsiders that have come in. And that's the other pastime that's in the area, and that's snow skiing. And we had enough of it last weekend, so it's just starting to melt. 
the outcomes that we found. Neighboring, y'all know what neighboring is? I had this 92-year-old lady tell me what neighboring is. She coined the term and she, she said, I had to wait to interview her until she got back from being in Europe for a week. Ruth had everything but her PhD. She hadn't finished her dissertation. And she was a teacher most of her life. She was a maiden lady, as she referred to herself. Everybody else would have called her an old maid, except that she preferred maiden lady. And so we interviewed her when she got back in, and I was interviewing her. She says, I just want you to know, I was born in this room. And I said, oh, and she says, and that's where, and she's giving me the breakdown of the various rooms in the house. Now, she's 92. And she said, what you really need to know about Appalachia is neighboring. And neighboring is a wonderful concept. It means if you're sick, your entire neighbors, all your neighbors will come take care of you. They'll help you get your hay in. They'll help feed the cows. They'll take care of your kids. They'll do whatever you need. And I said, well, neighboring sounds like a really neat thing to me. And she says, oh, no, it's a two-edged sword. And I said, well, Ruth, what do you mean? She says, Last year, I brought my boyfriend home, and everybody knew it. Now, I thought at 92, honey, go for it. The dichotomies that you see are really phenomenal, and that's the things we talked about earlier, where you find that you have a split in the environment in some manner, shape, or form. One time, the federal government decided that they would build health care centers for folks in Appalachia because they didn't have health care but they put the center on the wrong side of the mountain and nobody would go there. So there is still to this day this gorgeous center that was, had all kinds of money poured into it, but nobody would go because it was on the wrong side of the mountain. You've seen it. Health, we already talked about, you've got to be functional. So whenever you deliver health care, what do you focus on? If you can't tie what they, need to do to how they function, are they going to listen to you? Probably not. I loved it. We had a New York resident come down and do a rotation with us. And he told this older couple, I guess they were in their mid-70s, they lived up on a hill. The only way you could get to their house was a swinging bridge. They both had hypertension. They were 90% self-efficient. That meant they did all their own food, they did all their own clothing, they did everything. So they did 95% of their own stuff, they were self-sufficient. That meant that they processed their pork, they dried their meat, they canned their vegetables. And these folks came down and he told them they couldn't have any more salt. So we took him on a home visit and said, all right, then you teach them, how are they going to preserve these things without the salt? So he elected as how he might change his approach to how you treat that. So health is very different. Empowerment is the other thing. And that is you cannot do to somebody. You guys all have love having somebody telling you, I know better than you, and you need to do what I say, right? You all just do that right away. You just say, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, right? Mm -hmm. How come I don't believe that? Resolution. What will you do with it, and how will you manage it? And there's always hope. And that's the thing that just amazes me. You can have an economically depressed, no insurance coverage, no nothing, and there's always hope for the future. I mean, it's just amazing to watch. One of the things, and I put this in because the NPs are your partners in health, and that's kind of the approach that we take to care. One of the patterns that we discerned in Appalachia, I want all of you to think with me. This is kind of, try it. Do you remember the first time you went away from home? Everybody? Esther? When you left for school, okay? The first time, think about the first time you were really away from home and your mom and everybody else and you got sick. You remember that? Oh. Oh, you, you felt terrible, your throat hurt, and you didn't feel good. What did you do? No, you wouldn't call your mom yet. You're going to be a big person. You're up on your own. Not yet. You will. What did you do? Yeah. Uh, I told my mom. 
Uh, what you will do is the first thing you did was you will treat yourself with whatever your mom taught you to treat yourself with. For me, I had to take two aspirin, drink orange juice, and keep working. Now, what did you do? Orange juice, vitamin C, and sleep. But all of you will do self-care activities that you learn from your mom. Okay, that didn't work. You still feel terrible. Oh, it feels awful. <gasps> then what do you do? Yeah. Huh? You cried? Okay. I can, I can live with that, yeah. Then you call mom. So you've got two steps here, okay? You treat yourself because you're a big kid now. You can take care of yourself. So you treat yourself. And then the next thing you do is you call mom. So you do whatever mom tells you to do, and that doesn't work. Oh, my goodness, you still feel terrible. You feel awful, and you're still hurt. What do you do next? Go to the doctor? Not in Appalachia. No? If you know, you know somebody that's a nurse. And somebody in your kith and kin network is a nurse. And you'll say, oh, Sarah, I did this and this, and it didn't work, and I still feel bad. Tell me, what can I do? And the nurse will say, whatever, okay? That still doesn't work. Now, you guys are all professionals, right? So you would never do something like that. I understand. I, I'm not talking about you guys. You would never do anything like this. But you know Mabel down the road? She had some symptoms like that, and she has some of her medicine left. Now, none of you have ever taken Mabel's medicine, have you? Okay, so you tried Mabel's medicine. Guess what? That doesn't work. Next step. The next step in the Appalachian pattern is, you ever watched TV and felt rotten and looked at those NyQuil ads? It's like Madison Avenue is talking right to you. I, I, you feel, if you have a cold and you watch the NyQuil ad, it's like, it's talking right at me. Yes, sir. That's it. I need to do that. Okay, so you use an OTC. That doesn't work. The first professional somebody in Appalachia may see is probably, if there's no nurse, okay? If there's a nurse around, they'll see him. If there's no nurse, the first professional they'll see is a pharmacist. And they'll go into the pharmacist and they'll say, oh, Rob, can you tell me, I've got this, 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 and this. And I've seen pharmacists all over Appalachia talk to folks and say, you really need to see your healthcare provider. See, we've got them trained. They don't say doctor, they say healthcare provider. You need to see your healthcare provider. Oh no, just tell me something I can take. So they'll, they say, I've already tried this, 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 and this. Now they don't say they took Mabel's medicine because they know Rob will yell at them for that one, okay? And so the pharmacist will recommend something. Okay, that doesn't work. Then they may wind up at somebody's office. In Appalachia, there are a lot of J1 physicians. Are you all familiar with those? Those are foreign medical graduates that if they will work in underserved areas are given visas. Now these folks, I don't wanna take anything away from them, but they don't have the culture and the language barrier is significant. And so it's very difficult to communicate not only symptoms, but treatment modalities. And in some places in Appalachia, they haven't passed the flex test yet, but they're still practicing. But in defense, these folks will treat them to the best of their ability. That doesn't work. So then they refer them to a tertiary center, you know, probably a local or small, larger community center for specialty care. That doesn't work. And what happens is they wind up getting referred to the large teaching hospitals eventually. And you know what happens? They die. So if you go back to the holler, you say, oh, I don't want to go to Case Western. You go there, you die. West Virginia University, it's a good hospital. Any of these hospitals, I hate hospitals, but they're good hospitals. Oh, you don't go to West Virginia, you die. 
What I didn't say about this pattern of behavior is how much time went between there. And so what you have is people seeking health care in not a traditional pattern, as you would identify going to the doctor right away, are going to the health care provider, but they have tried all these things, and unless you intervene in that pattern earlier, you won't make them healthy. They won't get better. They'll just be train wrecks by the time they get in there. And then what happens back in the holler is it's like, oh, Uncle Joe went to WVU and he died. So the perception is you don't want to go to the large tertiary care centers because what happens? You die. Just think what you could do if you intervene much earlier in that process. And so that's what we do. And you have to value what the community values. The value of family and roots becomes so very important. We also have folks that have no insurance, they're underinsured, and I joke with uh, Emily and Esther because the only time you do lock your car doors where we live is when zucchini's ripe. Because you'll go out and you won't have any room to get in the car because your car is full of zucchini because everybody brought you the zucchini. They want to pay with whatever they can and they'll bring you anything. I did even get a live chicken one time. The lack of confidence in large centers, I think you can see how that comes about. The findings that we also see, there's limited economic resources, as we've already looked at. Come on, thing. The significance of the cultural specific care becomes so important because you've got to intervene in that pattern very early. And they want consistency and continuity of care. You can't go running away. You've got to be part of the community. All of the providers that we have on our staff, there's four NPs. All of us have other jobs. All of us work at the practice. All of us are part of the community. If they're not part of the community, it doesn't work. We had somebody outside the community, and because they weren't going to live there, nobody wanted to come see them. So I thought that was a very interesting kind of thing. All of our board members, because it's now a 501c3, which is a nonprofit corporation and a federally qualified health center, all of the board members are community residents. And we treat. If you're going to be successful, if you're a lifelong resident, it's wonderful if you can get educated in the community that you grew up in. But you have to prove you're committed. And in Appalachia, being a female is very helpful because you're perceived as a healer. I call it the Peacock Society, and I apologize, gentlemen, but I think you may have some relate to this, that the women get very manipulative. They actually make the decisions, but then they let the men think they made it. Now, none of you all have ever, ever experienced that, I'm sure. But. You have to be relatively low key. You have to be caring. And boy, can folks pick up if you are trying to put on a show. If you don't care, they know it. You have to be perceived as knowledgeable. <laughs> There's many times that I'll say, I have no idea. But I found out, I can find out, and I will find out. And the relationship with the university has been phenomenal because Penn State's commitment has been to improving quality of life. And by my association with Penn State, they really believe it. So it's really changed the perceptions all the way around. The coalitions that you form can be many and varied. I will have to tell you, I called and asked for a DSL line. And the operator said, not in your lifetime. <laughs> so we now have satellite dishes that we have up and down satellite communications, so we're all on the internet. We are all electronic medical records and have been for the last eight years. It's been very interesting because we've had to wait for our specialist referral panels to catch up with us so that they can uh, take our records and we don't have to write up things. Um, the whole goal is improved living and improved quality of life. Currently, we have 6,000 patients at the practice. 
We are all community owned. It is no longer Mona's practice, but that's what they call it anyway. Um, there's four nurse practitioners, as I said. We have seven personnel, and one of the things we've committed to is to improve community confidence. In doing so, we've hired only local residents, but we do on-the-job training, so they get skills, they become phlebotomists, they can become medical assistants, and guess what? They can drive 30 miles and get paid double what we can afford to pay them. So it's a two-edged sword. And then we have to hire a new person from the community and then we train them and that kind of thing. So what's happening is we're training folks. We now have 15 more bachelor's prepared nurses that came out of the community since the practice has started because they got started by BNMAs. And that to me is a great thing. The outcomes that we've had, we've had the teenage pregnancy in the county since we started. We were the number one county in the state of teen pregnancies. It's now half of that. The hemoglobin A1Cs on an average of all the diabetics were running at about 11 when we started. We have the average hemoglobin A1C of our diabetic population is seven. And we're working with SIRMUSA, which is a center for excellence in medically underserved areas out of St. Francis. And what it does is we're doing telehealth and it's doing telehealth also in a community in Russia that we're interacting with. So it, it's going all over. Hypertension goal, we get them at 120 over 80, and they'll very sheepishly come in if they've forgotten their meds. It's real interesting to watch them try to help each other. Lipid control, that's probably the hardest one that we've had to deal with. Weight loss, we've lost 5,000 pounds in the group that we serve. And for a while, we had a meeting every week. Two of the nursing students mapped out a mile trail. The older folks, we put backpacks on so that they'll keep their heads up and not bend over like this while they're walking. So it's very interesting. Tobacco use, we've had a, quite a research project on medical use of nicotine, documenting how the policy should be formulated. We did a bunch with asthma control and lead reduction. And this was a, a department of, um, environmental stuff, and they came out to present us with a check for the research project that we had submitted for, and the guy says, well, you have to control the roaches, right? He's out of Philly. <laughs> and I said, no, we don't have a lot of roaches here. And he says, well, what are the triggers for asthma? Because that's the big trigger in high rises that, you know, is, are the roach population what they bring in and that kind of stuff. And I said, well, we don't have a lot of roaches. He says, well, what are your asthma triggers? And I said, well, it depends what kind of wood they're burning in the wood stove, whether they're using kerosene heaters, you know, how are they venting their environment? He says, oh man, I never thought of that. <laughs> so it was real interesting. So we decreased the emergency room visits for asthma by seven fifths, I mean 75%. We had two visits during the whole time, and that was it. We wanted to increase community confidence. I think we can safely say we have. The skill building, which is the two-edged sword of on-the-job on training. The awareness of opportunities. Some folks in the area had not any clue what one might be able to do with their lives. And so we've increased their awareness. The economic additions to the community, we employ 15 people. That's 15 more than they had previously. It really has made an impact and it's improved the quality of life. We do patient satisfaction surveys every six months just to readjust our practice to see what we're doing. Um, and it works. Sources of revenue, we now have insurance. We have federally qualified health center status, Medicare, Medicaid, no insurance, and we really have some folks that are really good insured. Um, I think one of the biggest compliments is we have people that drive from Pittsburgh, we're 75 miles south, to because they like NP care, they're the lawyers. So that gives me good feeling. The other large group that we have are the pharmacists are all our patients. So we take care of most of the pharmacists and their families. So when I get folks like that that come for our care, I think we're doing all right. The future, who knows? The World Wide Web is really changing us. It's changing what we do. And I thought what I'd start, stop with 
are some images so you can see why people really truly love to live there. And this is just Appalachia. Those are hillbilly hankerings, and that's when I say I do wear shoes. And I can't find a picture of a still, so if any of you find one, send me one, please. That's some of the winter stuff, and those are, that's a grist mill, so you could have stone ground cornmeal. That's a dulcimer. Interesting enough, every mountain community I've been in around the world, and I've been on every continent, all have an instrument similar to that. That's bass fishing and trout fishing. That's a little old man's cabin that it lives up on the hill from us. Those are called pitcher plants, and you can't find them any place in the world except in the Appalachian chain. And that's just more of the waterfalls that are beautiful. The environment, now that's a good, sturdy bridge. That's not the swinging kind, okay? And we have three seasons in Appalachia. We have the frozen time, we have the dry time, and then we have the mud. So during the winter and during the summer, you can get in and out. During mud season, you can't. In case you all don't recognize it, that's the road to the house. So that's the road I have to come through to my house. Home is where your family is, and this is some of the hills. This is the gorge that goes down through, and that's called Cooper's Rocks, if any of you ever get down there. And it's just beautiful. That's called Saddleback Mountain. I wonder why it got that name. And I always have to finish that that's the national flower for Appalachia. <laughs> and it is the one thing that has done the most to change the patterns of behavior because it has put folks in touch in communications to worldwide things and has truly changed behavioral patterns, some for the good and some for the bad, but it has changed. And that's it. And I thank you guys very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mona. Uh, oh, do we have this microphone back on? There we go. Thanks. We, uh, hang tight, you guys. We're not quite done yet. Uh, we'd like to uh, take an opportunity. We have two microphones down at the front. Uh, if you would, uh, if any of you have a question that you'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Counts, uh, step up to the microphone. Uh, we are uh, videotaping this or uh, recording this, so this will be available via webcast. So I've been informed that uh, you need to step uh, up close to the microphone and speak into it so that your question will be heard. So does anybody have a question that they would like to uh, come up and pose to uh, doc Dr. Counts? Come on, you chickens. Come on. <laughs> Boy, you're more you're talkative when we don't want you to be. <laughs> Anybody? For extra points? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, if you if you don't mind. I thought it would be interesting to know what are the similarities between rural Africa and rural Appalachia. I, I really think that's a great question. Actually, there's a lot of similarities between any rural environment. Anytime that you find folks have difficulty with access, both transportation, uh, communication, limited resources, you have some similar subsistence kind of behaviors. And so the inward turning type of culture is very similar in backwoods Kenya as it is any place, including Australia, New Zealand, you know, any backwoods type of area, when you say backwoods, relatively isolated. It, it was real interesting. We found some pockets in um, northern Kentucky that never knew we went to World War II because there was no communication means at that time, and they were down several different haulers that never got that kind of information, so it really has turned different. Sorry, thank you, sir. Anybody else? Y'all gonna come down and visit so you can work down there for a little bit? You're cordially invited to come down. You can talk to several of your classmates that did come. Um, 
It's an interesting experience. It's extremely gratifying. The real problem is, is if I don't stay at the practice or if I'm not at the clinic, they still come to my house. So I, the one thing I did do is I now can chart on them and keep records of what I said so, and we can put it right into their electronic record because that was making me extremely nervous not being able, you know, having people just, oh, drop by. Oh, while you're here, would you check my ear? You know, that kind of thing. And not keeping records did make me nervous. So we do have, we have no physician on site at all. And we can't afford to have a physician on site. If we did, we couldn't afford the insurance. So we, uh, do our own care. But we do have lots of folks available by phone. And I will share with you, right before I left, I found out that we were awarded the gold star for the managed care from the managed care companies. And the gold star was because we maxed out every single HEDIS measure by 150% and beat out all the other family practice. Um, Now you can see the bigger target getting on my back here. <laughs> so. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Council once again. I just have to let you know I'm an avid whitewater rafter and kayaker, so I have to come oh, down good. and Oh, good. We've got chair. class six. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's give Dr. Council another round of applause. Just thank her for being here. <laughs> just wanted to... Uh, Thank, every, uh, thank everybody, just stay seated, just, uh, just could be just another two minutes or so. If you'd like to talk to Dr. Counts a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, if you had some questions, yeah, feel free to come on down after I dismiss you. Uh, but I did want to let, uh, also let you and Dr. Counts know that as a token of our appreciation for the work um, that you're doing with underserved populations, the School of Nursing uh, is going to make a donation of $1,500 to the Mount Morris Clinic. So. So thanks again for putting up the heat. Just to let you know, when I got here at 5, it was hot, and we asked to have the air conditioning turned on, so I apologize for that. You guys have uh, uh, put up with it very well. You've been very patient. So. And it's not been a fault. <laughs> I hope not. Um, <laughs> and it does, did my heart well to hear Dr. Counts talking about uh, the technology aspect of things and how the how the internet and World Wide Web is changing things. So for those of you in my informatics class, if you've had me before, have me now. I'm not the only one that, uh, that talks about this, so it was nice to you. Thanks for putting that plug in. All right, that is, uh, that'll wrap up our night. You are dismissed, and have a wonderful evening.